Nelson. I'm Chief Development Officer for the Army uh, Heritage Center Foundation at the War College. Um, you know, it's a real pleasure to be here today and to introduce my friend. For over a half a century, uh, Joe Galloway is one of America's premier war and foreign correspondents. He retired as a senior military correspondent for Knight Rider. And before that, he was a special consultant to General Colin Powell at the State Department. In 2013, he was sworn into service to consult on the Vietnam War's 50th anniversary commemorative project ran by the Secretary of Defense. He's also a permanent consultant to Ken Burns' Florentine Films, which makes documentary histories and, and, and recently released the Vietnam War uh, in 2016 on PBS, a great, a great one. I've, I've watched that. Uh, Joe is a, is a Texan and he spent uh, over two decades as a foreign uh, correspondent and bureau chief for UPI and 20 years as the senior editor and senior writer for US News and World Report magazine. Uh, during his course of uh, his foreign postings, which included assignments in Japan and Indonesia and India and Singapore, he served his three years as the UPI's bureau chief in Moscow. And uh, he also served many, many tours in war, war areas, including Vietnam, uh, which of course was highlighted in, in, in the movie and in his books that he'll talk about today. He covered the 1971 India-Pakistan War and over a other half dozen of other combat operations. In the early 90s, uh, Joe was embedded in Desert Shield and Storm with the 24th Infantry. Uh, he was uh, uh, covered the Haiti incursion, and he made trips into Iraq in over several years uh, during the war on terror. Uh, the late General Schwarzkopf uh, said of Joe that Joe is the finest court combat correspondent our, and, and our generation's uh, uh, soldier and uh, soldier reporter and soldier's friend. Um, he co-authored a, a couple of books with uh, General Moore, uh, including the national bestseller, which is approaching probably two million copies, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. And it was made into the great movie, We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson, which you saw the clip of. Um, Joe will talk about his other books and his other films today, as well as his, his new book, which I hope he'll tell us about at the end. Uh, he also co-authored, for example, the history of the Persian Gulf War, and, um, and we were soldiers once a look back at the battlefields of Vietnam. Um, Joe was decorated with the Bronze Star in, in 1998 uh, with a V for rescuing wounded soldiers at, at Idrang Valley in, in Vietnam. He is the only civilian to be awarded that medal uh, uh, by the U.S. Army. He's also been honored in a number of ways, including National Magazine Award in 1991, um, the National News Media Award for his coverage of the Gulf War, the President's Award of the Arts uh, for the Vietnam Veteran Association, um, the Distinguished uh, 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 Service Award for the Robert Wing uh, Award, he, he received uh, uh, wonderful recognition at the Abraham Award on the uh, Union League of Pennsylvania, Abraham Lincoln Award. And uh, he received uh, the Doughboy Award, the highest uh, honor the Army's infantry can bestow on an individual. He serves on a number of boards, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the 1st Cavalry Division, the, nine, the National Infantry Museum, the Museum of American Wars, the Citadel, and the Museum of, uh, or the Military Reporters and Editors Association. Uh, Joe has received honorary doctorates from Norwalk University and where I first met Joe in 2002 at Mount St. Mary College in Newburgh, New York. Um, he, three years ago, Joe was honored at, the, at our organization, the Army Heritage Center, um, and on the, on the Boots on the Ground Award for his life's work. Uh, without further ado, please welcome my friend, uh, Joe Galloway. Joe. Thanks, Tim. Uh, pleasure to be here with all of you and uh, ready to answer questions and uh, talk about uh, the books that I have had a hand in and uh, 
the two movies, each of which takes a very small slice of a very long career. Uh, but it's, it's always interesting to have Hollywood focus a camera on a, a piece of your life and see what they do with it. Uh, all of it really started with, we were soldiers once and young. The story of the battles in the Iadrang Valley in November of 1965. I was present on the ground uh, alongside Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, uh, Battalion Commander, 1st first, first Battalion, 7th U.S. Cavalry, in a place called Landing Zone X-Ray, a football field-sized clearing at the base of a pretty good-sized mountain that ran back into Cambodia and was itself a highway for the North Vietnamese uh, coming and going in those areas. Uh, I think Hal Moore and I knew by the end of that three day struggle to survive against overwhelming odds that one day we were gonna write this book. I knew as a, a United Press International correspondent that my bosses figured the second coming of Christ was worth 1200 words, but only if you got a picture. Uh, so I knew leaving Landing Zone X-Ray that there was no way in hell I could tell all that I had seen all that these American boys had done and suffered and died for in this place in 1200 words. Uh, I wrote my stories, but, but I knew the, the real story had not been told. And uh, over the years, I once tried to write it as a, a, a fiction didn't work. I couldn't even get two chapters that way. I knew it had to be the truth. And uh, I was on my way to take up the job in Moscow in uh, 1976. Hal Moore was the desper of the army and I had dinner at his home on Fort Myer. And after a few drinks and a good meal and some good conversation, uh, we talked about what we were going to do and when. And what we shook hands on was an agreement that when Hal retired from the Army and I quit wandering around the world uh, uh, and came home, that we would begin the research. And uh, he retired from the Army the next year, and I came home in 1980. And uh, I was occupied for a few months, settling in as the bureau chief in Los Angeles. And uh, one night I'm watching TV, and there's a movie on. I hadn't even known they had made a sequel to American Graffiti. And it picked up where the first movie left off, rolling these little clips of bios of what had happened to all these characters. And the geeky kid with the thick glasses who was always trying to get laid, his part, it said, he had been drafted into the army and sent to Vietnam and uh, and they started from there, and the screen on my TV suddenly is full of Huey helicopters, and uh, they're doing a tremendous assault landing, and there's mortars going off everywhere, and artillery, and uh, and I'm sitting in my living room in Los Angeles, arguably the safest place I'd been in in the last twenty years. 
and I'm shaking like a leaf and crying like a baby. And I, you know, I backed away and I, I thought about it. And I, I thought either you turn around and face this or it'll catch you and eat you alive. And the next morning I picked up the phone. I called Hal Moore at his house in Crested Butte, Colorado. And I said, Hal, you ready to start work on that book? And he said, sure am. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. And we sat down and we figured out that we knew where maybe 12 of the guys were and had a phone number for. But this was going to be a long, long haul. This is in the days before the worldwide phone book was on three CDs. Uh, we had to find these guys the old fashioned way, you know, somebody would remember a guy's nickname. Someone would remember his last name. Somebody else would remember what his hometown was. And I would call the American Legion and the VFW and the county veteran service officer and find some member of the guy's family and go from there. And we ended up interviewing over 250 individuals. It took us 10 years from the time we began until the book was published in 1992. The writing of the book took only six months. It was the research that was the killer. And we had started writing the book when the publisher said, you guys can't just write about landing zone x-ray. This is a two part fight. And landing zone Albany, the second battalion of seventh cavalry's one day fight right after ours you're going to have to tell that story too. So I'm writing one story. I'm on the phone chasing down second of the seventh guys and uh, calling them cold and interviewing them on the phone and putting together that story, which was horrific and remains a, a, a true nightmare. Uh, in six hours time, these guys walked into an L-shaped North Vietnamese battalion ambush, more than a battalion really. And in six hours time, 155 American boys were killed in the tall elephant grass, uh, another 130 wounded. There were com Company C, 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, started the day uh, with 115 men. And the next morning, precisely eight of those men were present and accounted for. All the rest had been either killed or wounded and evacuated. Uh, I, it, was, it was as bloody a thing as it ever gets. And, uh, it, uh, you know, you have the first half of the book, which is at least a, a success in command and a success in the fact that's, that most of us survived. Uh, and uh, you go one day later to, a, to an absolute disaster. Uh, it's, it's a hell of a book. It's a hell of a movie. It's, uh, sold a million, 300,000 copies in seven languages. It came out in 1992 and, uh, it's still selling. Uh, we followed that up in 2008 with a book we called, We Are Soldiers Still a journey back to the battlefields of Vietnam. And, and this tells the story of a trip that we made back to Vietnam, back to the battlefields in company with the old North Vietnamese commanders who tried their best to kill us all there. 
uh, a, a real journey in, in several ways and several levels. We, we shared a little bus coming from Way to Da Nang down Highway 1 to Nha Trang and up Highway 19 to Pleiku, stopping in on K on the way. Uh, and uh, ABC film crew was with us and they had the money. They hired a uh, Russian hind helicopter with Vietnamese pilots to fly us into the Iadrang Valley and to the battlefields. And uh, <clears throat> Al Moore arranged it with God that we had a day on the battlefield and then we loaded up the first chopper with all of the Vietnamese and most of the American veterans and shipped them off. And as soon as they were gone out of sight, uh, a monsoon rainstorm blew in and, and uh, the sun set and those Vietnamese pilots were not coming back for us that night. So Moore and me and the film crew and a couple of other of the Idrang veterans uh, were stranded on landing zone x-ray overnight. Uh, you know, this is five clicks from the Cambodian border and the Khmer Rouge were running raids uh, into the whole length of the border. Uh, causing a lot of trouble with the Vietnamese communists. And, uh, and we're sitting out there uh, with not a weapon among us. Uh, basically, the curious thing is that uh, General Wen Hu An, who was Hal Moore's opposite number in the battle, uh, was back in play coup and he tried to order those Vietnamese pilots to fly out in the dark and fetch us back. And they absolutely refused. And then he called Hanoi to the defense ministry to try to get them to order the pilots to fly. And they said, no, we don't do that. And by the way, are you telling us that you have an American general uh, a famous war correspondent, a national TV film crew sitting out by themselves in, in the jungle, five clicks from the Cambodian border. If anything happens to them, General, it's your ass. And uh, poor old General uh, uh, An walked the floor of his hotel room most of the night. He sent off a, uh, an intel guy to round up some uh, border police and uh, they got on a, a farm tractor with a flatbed trailer and crossed the Iadrang and came into the clearing to rescue us about four o'clock in the morning. And there were guys, it's like uh, Colonel George Forrest, who was asleep when all this took place. And he woke up, he looked up, and there's a guy in a pith helmet with an AK-47 standing over him in the dark. And he's, he's laying there wondering, can I, can I grab this guy and strangle him before he shoots me? And so it, it was, uh, it was interesting. It made a, a very different book, book, but one that, that, that I think tells a, some remarkable stories. The third book is coming out in five days. It's called, They Were Soldiers, The Sacrifices and Contributions of Our Vietnam Veterans. Uh, it too is a different book. It's profiles and interviews with 49 Vietnam veterans, all ranks, all branches, uh, two or three military nurses, uh, 
everybody from General Colin Powell to Rich Armitage to Fred Smith of FedEx uh, to Diane Carlson Evans, the Army nurse. And we focused less on the war that they fought and more on the lives that they have lived and the good they have done for their communities and our country since that war. Uh, I, I'm proud of this book as I am of the previous two. Uh, I think it's long overdue, honest look at that cohort of young Americans who served honorably in Vietnam, uh, came home to no welcome, no respect, uh, a bitter end of things, uh, had to go to ground, couldn't talk about what they had seen and done. And uh, I, as I've said in many a speech, they may not have been the greatest generation, but by God, they were the greatest of their generation. And this book tries to reflect that. And this is a time when there are people who weren't even born when we were out on the battlefields of Vietnam who were writing books with titles like Kill Everything That Moves and would have us uh, believe that every American who served in Vietnam was a, a Lieutenant Calley, a baby killer. And uh, I did four tours in Vietnam from the beginning of the American involvement to the end of it and to the end of Vietnam, South Vietnam. And I never saw that. Not in a hundred combat operations, sure. Uh, you know, misplaced artillery strikes, misplaced air strikes. Uh, people got killed, but deliberate massacre of civilians, I didn't see it. And I, and I honestly don't believe it. I don't believe it of those young men that I stood beside in, in the Iadrang and in a lot of other operations and battles. Uh, the movies, let's talk movies. <clears throat> we were soldiers. Uh, you got a best-selling book, so we get a Hollywood agent and uh, over 18 months time, we are approached by two types of Hollywood denizens. Those who have money, but no ideas, and those who have ideas, but no money. And uh, they drive you crazy. Finally, Hal and I just agreed to fire the agent and take the book off the Hollywood film market. And uh, we were at VMI doing a, doing a lecture or two. And uh, we'd done that and we were in quarters and we, we had a, a bit of scotch and uh, the phone rang and a fellow uh, said, Mr. Galloway, you don't know me, but I'm a movie maker. And my name is Randall Wallace and uh, I've read your book and I want to make that film. And I said, Mr. Wallace, you, you've got 90 seconds to answer me one question uh, before I hang up in your ear. And he said, what's that? And I said, do you believe in heroes? And he said, I do. Honest to God, I do. He said, I just finished writing a screenplay for uh, Mel Gibson uh, called Braveheart. And I'll send you a copy of that and you'll see what I believe in. Well, I said, we can talk then. That was the beginning of eight years of work between that phone call and the movie premiere of We Were Soldiers. Four years on the screenplay alone. 
Wallace knew nothing about the American military uh, and Vietnam. Uh, he was, uh, he knew this was an important story and he didn't want to screw it up. And he said, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm going to let you guys read every iteration of the screenplay and make corrections. And a damn good thing he did, uh, you know, the first, the first, almost the first page of his first screenplay had Hal Moore knocking on the door of Brigadier General Harry Kennard and in the middle of the night and Kennard in his pajamas and a bathrobe comes to the door and Lieutenant Colonel Moore shakes his finger under his nose and says, Harry, I got a bone to pick with you. Well, we said that's not quite how Uncle Sam's army works. Uh, battalion commanders do not go banging on the door of their division commander in the middle of the night uh, with bones to pick. So we, we went along for four years uh, trying to make this as truthful a movie as we could. In the end, uh, we decided 75% reality based on our book and 25% Hollywood bullshit. And that's about as good as you're ever going to get out of Hollywood. And that's with Hal Moore and I on their ass all the time. Uh, one or the other or both of us on the sets while they're filming the movie, uh, trying our best to keep them from their worst impulses. And uh, you know where the faults are. I certainly do. Uh, how more would never, the finality, finale of that movie where Hal Moore has all his men clumped up in a cluster and they charge down the hill and into the teeth of the heavy North Vietnamese machine guns and at the last possible second while the gunners just pulling the trigger here comes two previous slick Huey helicopters that are now armed with many guns which did not arrive in Vietnam for another 18 months. And they hose down and kill all the North Vietnamese. Uh, I don't know how they snuck that past the two of us because I think we would have killed someone to stop it. Uh, it didn't happen that way. Every time they made a Hollywood decision I could point to you the section in the book where the truth was, and the truth was more dramatic than their drama. Uh, the, the battle didn't end with the Huey Slicks and their miniguns and the charge into the machine guns. It ended on the third morning when Hal Moore ordered the entire perimeter to move out a hundred meters and then everyone turn around and face back toward the clearing, fall down on their hands and knees and crawl through the tall grass until we found the two missing American bodies. Because Hal Moore was not going to leave that clearing until he had accounted for every single man he brought into that place. Uh, and, and I submit that that would have been a far more dramatic ending to that movie. Uh, but I wasn't the director. The thing about <clears throat> writing a best-selling book and then selling it to Hollywood is it's kind of like putting your child up for adoption. 
uh, once you sign the piece of paper and take the check, that child is no longer yours. It belongs to them. And any participation that you have is purely voluntary on their part. And I must tell you that Hollywood has the lowest possible opinion of writers, even authors. And once you've taken their money, uh, they don't want to see you again. Uh, Randall Wallace was a different sort of director. And uh, when it comes to the second movie, Shock and Awe, Rob Reiner is a different kind of director. Uh, that movie uh, is a very thin slice of time in late 2002, early 2003, and it focuses on Washington, D.C. and journalism and uh, the Bush administration's preparing the country to bite in on a lie uh, so they could invade Iraq and overthrow Saddam Hussein. Uh, now, overthrowing Saddam Hussein might be a nice idea, but uh, uh, they were making up stuff by the yard in order to drag us into an unnecessary war. And uh, there were four of us at the Knight Ritter Washington Bureau uh, under Bureau Chief John Walcott. And we decided to do the hard reporting. Uh, the Bushies were saying uh, Saddam has bought these high quality aluminum tubes so that he can enrich uranium he's bought from Africa. Uh, so we do the hard reporting and call around to the mid-level officials who knew the truth which was that Saddam had bought aluminum irrigation tubes. You, you cannot enrich uranium with irrigation aluminum tubes. It don't work. Uh, it was not true. Uh, the problem was is that no one was reading our reports. We were debunking the Bush lies one after the other, but even our own newspapers are not running the stories because the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, were like the rest of American newspapers beating the war drums as hard as they could. The New York Times was putting uh, <clears throat> dispatches by Judy Miller on the front page of their newspaper, and she was being spoon-fed propaganda by Scooter Libby, uh, Dick Cheney's uh, right-hand uh, liar. <clears throat> and uh, the New York Times, after it was all over, a year or so after the war, uh, would apologize to its readers for what it had done, for what Judy Miller had done, for the lies that she spread about everything from mobile bioweapon labs that were driving all over Iraq. Uh, and Miss Miller went on missions with the U.S. Army intel types searching all of Iraq after we had taken the place, looking for evidence of the mobile biowar labs, the nuclear project, all of this stuff, and found exactly nothing. Uh, so there's that. I think it's a good movie. It, uh, it had no promotion budget. It was a, a low dollar film. 
with very good actors. Uh, and uh, I was portrayed in that by, by Tommy Lee Jones. And my wife tells me that he really nailed me. He got it good. So I'll accept that as the judgment. Uh, I was played in the and we were soldiers by a young Canadian actor named Barry Pepper, who became an American, uh, who is a splendid young actor, uh, has, has won awards and stays busy. And, uh, and Tommy Lee Jones is Tommy Lee Jones. He's, he's, they could put a, carving on Mount Rushmore of, of Tommy Lee's craggy face. Uh, I'm much more handsome than he is, but uh, there we are. Uh, three excellent books, even if I say so myself, and two pretty good movies, uh, if I say so myself. Uh, I'm uh, ready to answer questions. Uh, uh, as I like to say, if you got the cojones to ask, I got the cojones to answer. So thank you so much for, for this. And I'm going to start with a question or actually ask you to relay a story for Willing that you shared with me in your home. And that was the story of when you went to Sergeant Major Bromley, greatly played by um, Sam Elliott in the film, that you went to his funeral and then you went to a diner after. Uh, would you share that? You remember? <laughs> That's a great story. Would you share it with everybody, your dinner with Sam Elliott that night and what happened? Uh, that, that, that was the only light moment in a very dark weekend when we laid Sergeant Major Plumley to rest. <clears throat> and after all the funeral and everything was over and, and Sam Elliott and my wife Gracie and I went to dinner at a cafe in downtown Columbus, Georgia. And we're sitting there, <clears throat> I ordered our dinner and I, out of the corner of my eye, I see three or four ladies uh, of indeterminate years sitting at the next table over and and they keep looking at Sam and looking harder at Sam and I know what's coming and one of them gets up and she comes over and she says aren't you Sam Elliot and Sam looks at her and says no ma'am I'm frequently mistook for him though <laughs> and the lady's jaw drops <laughs> and she turns around and slowly starts to go back to her table and Sam says, no, he said, come on back. I'm Sam. What can I do for you? So he had to take pictures with all of them and autograph napkins and so forth. But there he was with that distinctive voice denying he was who he was. That's a great story, Joe. That's a great story. <clears throat> Joe, we have a couple of questions uh, here, and I would encourage anyone who does have questions to type them, please, not in the chat, but in the, in the Q&A section. Joe, here's a question. First off, this person thanks you for speaking. Uh, speaking of books and movies, what is your opinion of the Ken Burns series, which I know you cooperated on, on the war in Vietnam? How do you think he nailed it? I think if you are just getting into studying the history of the Vietnam War, you can't do much better than watching the Ken Burns series. I mean, it takes you back to the very beginnings in 1941, 42, and brings you forward and tells you all of the stuff you need to know and feeds in the interviews with people on both sides. Uh, and I think that they shot very fairly. They were, <laughs> Burns was attacked on the left. He was attacked on the right. 
And when that happens, that means you're probably shooting it right down the middle and getting it about right. And I think he did. I, yeah. I say he, the truth is that the bulk of the work on that film documentary was done by Ken Burns's co-producer, a lady named Lynn Novick. And she did all of the interviews and, uh, and uh, carried the bucket on most of that film and did a splendid job. Um, thank you. Um, do you do you happen to have in front of you? Uh, uh, one of our attendees was curious if you happen to have your book covers in front of you. At least your last one, uh, the new one. Do you have that? Oh, there it is. That's there's good. the new one. Uh, let me see. I think I got a couple of more here. Here's the middle one. We are soldiers still. Wonderful. And now hold on, I'm having to pull a lot of stuff down, but here's the trade paperback version of We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Very nice. Thank you, so Jim. There it is. If if I never write anything else, I'm I'm got a body of work there that I'm very proud of. And my wife tells me that I absolutely must write my memoirs before I forget all that stuff. Well, thank you. Um, Joe, how do you think, uh, if you had to compare the two, would you say uh, uh, Barry Pepper versus, uh, um, uh, uh, my goodness. Um, Tommy Lee. Thank you. Tommy Lee Jones portrayed you. Which one which one really hit you at the particular time, or did they both do a, a, an admirable job? Both of them did admirable jobs, but I would say, uh, I'll tell you a story about Barry Pepper. Uh, he had a thousand questions. I went and had a hamburger with him at some ranger joint out in the flatlands out of Columbus, Georgia, and he sat there and asked every one of those thousand questions and he was writing my answers down on the napkins in this joint. And uh, he, he wanted to know what was in my backpack. And I said, well, you know, there's color film, black and white film, uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, M16 magazines and some boxes of unmagazined ammo and uh, a change of socks and a couple of canteens of water. And I said, but why are you asking? He said, I'm gonna go out and buy all that stuff and put it in my pack so I'll be accurate. I wow. said, no, nobody's gonna know it's there, Barry. He said, wrong. He said, I'll know it's there. And he says, uh, do you wear dog tags? I said, yes, I did. Really? He said, uh, what was your blood type? I said, what do you want to know for? He says, oh, I'm going to have a set made and I want them to be accurate. And I said, you better hope you don't get hurt on the set and need a transfusion, it'll kill you. <laughs> but he, and I'm telling Hal more of this, and he said, Joe, I'm really worried, you know, I've been around Mel Gibson now for days and weeks, and he hasn't asked one damn question of me. <laughs> Two different schools of acting, you know, young Pepper, 10,000 questions, uh, going to do everything exactly accurate. And Mel Gibson, who asked no questions, but hung around Hal Moore and soaked him up like a dry sponge. And uh, Hal Moore's kids will tell you that they can sit in a dark theater, close their eyes, and they hear their father talking in Mel Gibson's words. Uh, so I guess they both got it right. And, uh, Tommy Lee, he got 
he got me pretty good, according to my wife. And he's, uh, he, Tommy Lee Jones has a reputation of <clears throat> being something of a cranky asshole on set. But uh, <clears throat> my wife took a look at him the first day we met in New Orleans on, on the movie set. And she said, Joe, I looked into his eyes and, and he's not that. He's, he's a very kind-hearted man. And uh, I believe that my, my six-year-old grandson was on the set and he wrapped Tommy Lee around his little finger in about 30 seconds. So I think my wife's judgment on him was right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, we have at least two, two questions here. Uh, let me see if I can frame them both together. One person wants to, well, both of them want to know your perspective of the Sergeant Major Plumley. What was he really like? What memories might you share? And very specifically, how did, uh, how do you think he was portrayed by Sam Elliott in, in, uh, in the film? Uh, Basil Plumley uh was an old army sergeant major gruff man of few words and when he spoke those few words if you were in his chain you sure better listen uh he had been through a couple of previous wars and and uh and he knew that hard training is what saves lives in combat. And so he was in favor of the hardest training there was. Uh, I would say after he retired from the Army, he worked for 15 years at Martin Army Hospital in, in Fort Benning uh, and retired again. And uh, Hal and I had started the research on this book and he wanted to drive me around uh, Fort Benning uh, and show me all the places where his battalion had trained and where their barracks were and all of that. And afterward, we were going to go to Sergeant Major Plumley's house for coffee and a piece of uh, uh, Miss Plumley's uh, sweet potato pie, and uh, we drove up, and he was waiting for us out in the yard. The sergeant major was, and I got out, and I walked over to him, and I stuck out my hand to shake his, and he he pulled me into a bear hug, mm. and I was never more shocked in my life. Uh, at that gesture. Uh, it's kind of like uh, being uh, grabbed and hugged by God himself. Uh, you don't expect it. Uh, Plumley and I became very good friends through the years. Uh, stayed, stayed in pretty good touch. And, uh, and I was asked to do the eulogy at his funeral in the old chapel at Fort Benning, and later would do the eulogy for uh, uh, General Hal Moore at his funeral at the old post cemetery at Fort Benning. Uh, two of my best friends, Sam Elliott did a beautiful job of portraying Plumley, except I like to say he wasn't quite gruff enough. But when we premiered the movie at Fort Benning and the stars came down and uh, Plumley was there and we walked out of the theater after it was over and uh, Plumley standing there and Sam Elliott comes up to him and says, well, Sergeant Major, what do you think? And Plumley just stood there 
stone face for about a minute and a half. And Sam Elliott is starting to sweat. And Plumley says, Nah, he said, Sam, you done it good. And Sam goes, oh, like that. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question. So I'm going to try to summarize this. It's a good one. Um, when you, when you're writing, when you were writing with, uh, with, with Hal and, and probably in general, there's a lot of moments that you could, you could focus on a lot of things that happen, uh, during that battle, for example, uh, how do you decide what to cover? Number one. And, and number two, when you were discussing those particular moments that went into the book, could you share with us, uh, did you see them differently? So how I remembered it one way and you remembered it another, for example, uh, and, and how to just decide on that uh, direction? There, there, first, I have to describe for you how it worked with the two of us. Uh, when it came down to writing the book, we did it at my farmhouse in uh, Northern Virginia. And uh, I was on the computer in my den and right around out the door and around the corner in my dining room, Hal Moore had all his stuff spread out over a long dining table. And I would yell a question and he would yell the answer and we went back and forth like that. Uh, the thing about writing a battle history is battles explode all over the field all at one time. How do books are linear? How do you pull everything into that line so that you can tell it in a coherent fashion. And I can write, that, that's my job. I've been doing that for all of my life. Hal Moore was the guy who could look at this thing and pull it into a linear form so that I could write it. So, uh, you know, I saw that partnership as fully equal 50-50. I couldn't have done that book without Hal Moore, and he certainly couldn't have done it without me. And the two of us made perfect partners. Uh, we saw most of the same things. Uh, Hal had his after action report that he wrote in the weeks after the battle and actually sent aerial recon planes out to shoot pictures of X-ray and Albany and Chupong Mountain. And so we had all of that as a, as a baseline. And then it was a matter of taking these stories of 250 individuals and what we decided going into this thing is, is we both read military history and it's usually written by somebody who's got the after action report but wasn't there. And uh, others are written by one general trying to settle scores with another general. Uh, and you ask them, well, why, why didn't you interview the guys who fought the battle? Ah, well, they say, you know, a soldier only sees 10 meters either side of his foxhole. And we said, yeah, that's true. But if you can get enough soldiers so that you have every 20 meters covered all the way around your battlefield, then a greater truth emerges from that. What we found is that the guy in the middle here, he, he didn't really want to talk about much about what he did 
but he wanted to tell you what his buddy Jack and his buddy Bill on the other side of his foxhole did. And if you can piece all that together, what we think we did with that book is what uh, uh, General Dick Cavazos told me when he read the manuscript. He said, Joe, you guys have moved the goalpost out 40 yards on either end. And uh, I take that as the highest compliment because I, I think Dick Cavazos, one of the smartest general officers I ever met. Well, so there's that. That's a great answer. You know, we've got one more question, but I don't know that we have the time. Do you have just a moment to try to answer it? Try it. Okay, this is a difficult one. All right, so the, the writer asks, um, given with all the exposure you've had, particularly when you combine your your uh, presentation of last week with, with uh, Generals Moore, McCafferty, and Skortskov. When you think about Desert Storm and you think about S.H.I.E.L.D. and you think about uh, uh, the landing zone at, 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 at Idrang, uh, how do you think that these generals, uh, do you think they ever could have imagined having flying into these uh, combat situations with female infantry leaders? Uh, what do you think Plumlin might have said on that topic? Uh, so, Joe, this person writes, I'd appreciate your candid thoughts on sharing this, these battle-tested perspectives of those leaders with this, with this issue. So uh, I'm going to leave you with that last question and let you answer it in only the way that you can. Uh, you know, Plumlee and Moore and probably Schwarzkopf, uh, they come out of an old army and an older tradition at West Point. And how more could no more think of women at West Point? Never mind women in the infantry. Uh, they're just some things that they can't see. Uh, my own thought is any woman who can pick me up and carry me a hundred yards to the uh, aid station can be in my infantry outfit. Uh, that, that's my answer. Uh, I, some of the toughest people I've ever met are women. Yes. And uh, I just, uh, I think that if they can hack it, they 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 should be allowed it, thank you uh, yeah thank you joe that was a very good answer thank you <laughs> well well let me let me thank you before i turn it back over to uh uh to mike but thank you joe i it means a great deal to me you know that we spoke about this and i know it makes a makes we're getting thank yous coming in we we, we appreciate you taking the time we wish you to be well we wish you much success on the new book. And I personally will be seeing you in a couple of weeks, I hope. All right. Take, take, take care. care. Mike, it's all yours, sir. No, thanks. Uh, old soldiers always like to sit around the table and tell stories. <laughs> those stories quite often get lost. What you've done of so great a value to us is that you've put them down on paper. And that will allow those stories to be told for generations beyond when you and I are no longer here. And that's really what's important, especially for our soldiers in the U.S. Army, because those soldiers have done great things and done great things for unselfish reasons. So thanks for writing them down, and uh, best of luck with the book, and hopefully we'll see you up here sometime soon also when we all get to travel. Thank you all for attending today's uh, webinar. Uh, we'll be posting it up uh, online in the next day or so. Please let your friends know about it, because this is sort of a unique experience of, of hearing a, a participant author and consultant to films uh, tell his stories of how you transition between all three of those areas to make sure a good story is told. So again, thanks and best of luck.